Hey, praise. Welcome to church. Join us for worship. Thank you, worship team. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, praise family. If we haven't met yet, my name is Mackenzie Brown. I run the Harriet House over in Monmouth, and we're just so excited you're here with us, whether it's in a community group, in a home, in a community group that's in the church, or on your own at home. I'm just here to welcome you to our family today and our gathering. Um, so we're just super stoked you're here. I do want to give a special shout out to community groups right now, though. If you're in a home, you're super blessed. Community group leaders 
we're so grateful um, and excited that you've opened up your home and allowed people in so that we can still worship together, so that we can gather and um, build community. Um, and so I just want you to know, community groups, you're not an afterthought. <laughs> Um, this actually is a prayer of ours that we've been praying for a long time. You're an answer to prayer um, that we would be able to build strong community and families. And, and really, I think that community groups and church in home, uh, the way we're doing discussions, this is the centerpiece of the movement of God right now. Um, so we're just so excited and super grateful. If you're not in a community group yet and you'd like to be, or you'd like to host, it's not too late. Uh, please reach out to one of us. If you're over in the McMinnville side of things, you can uh, email Nate Noble. That's Nate at praise.family. Or you can email Matt over in Monmouth, and that's Matt at praise.family, um, and we'll get you plugged in. You can also just show up to the church here at 10 o'clock at either of our locations, um, and we'll have groups meeting here. Um, so we're just so grateful, and we're so excited that we're together. We've got some exciting things happening today, so let's just open up service with prayer. Jesus, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be your church, God, um, that in whatever fashion we do it, God, that we would, uh, you know, seek you with our whole hearts today, God, and um, that really this month of August would be a season of growth, that you would strengthen us, um, prepare us for harvest, um, God, that, that whatever we have to do and and become and discuss and work through, God, um, to further your kingdom, we're here to do it. So just open up our hearts and our minds for service and what you have to say. Um, we're ready to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids, don't worry. We haven't forgotten you, but right before we get to Jessica and Ezra and our puppet show, we have a special send-off coming in from Joe and Judy and Diane and Beto. So we're going to pop in and check in with them. Well, praise family. Uh, we have some special things to discuss today, and I want to just uh, explain a little bit. There's a changing of the guard going on. Uh, Judy Rigwood has been our chief financial officer, our lady behind the scenes that in a very pastoral way has put her arms around all of our churches and helped us with the finances and has done a phenomenal job of that. And I know wherever you are and whatever church you're attending, you realize that things are going smooth, but this is why, because she's been in the behind scenes doing all this work. But it's a very pastoral role. It's a covering, it's support, it's understanding and prayers of faith many times in our, in our journey. And uh, we're so grateful that she has served us so well in all of our locations. She has uh, fallen in love and is getting married and moving to Mississippi. I know, it's quite a change. And I just want everybody to know that this is a, uh, <laughs> just a big shock. And you'd think, oh no, what are we going to do? Everything's going to crumble. And you know what? God always has what we need. And uh, we have Diane Roberts, who is going to be the new uh, chief financial officer, the new person behind the scenes, very pastoral. Most of you know her very well. And she will also, like Judy, uh, play a role that is much more than doing books. It's a pastoral care in the financial realm. And we're so excited that God has provided Diane at this moment. And so what we're going to have is Judy is going to have a prayer over Diane because she's passing the baton to Diane. And then Beto is going to explain our guiding value of being sent. And then Judy is, go I mean, then Diane is going to pray over Judy. So that's what's going to happen right now. So I'm going to ask Judy if, if you want to say a few words you can and then uh, have a prayer over Diane. Never give a woman a microphone, right? Because <laughs> of course I have a few things I want to say. And mostly what I, I want to say is uh, at the time that we were talking about this position, it was a lifesaver for me in many ways. It gave me something to focus on and it was just a really good position. And it was so much in a geeky sort of way, so much fun to set up, to set up 
processes and set things in order. So that was really fun. And the other thing that you might not think about, but when you get to be in a position like this, you the scary times turn into times of praise and you realize how precious God is and how much he provides for us. And so I wouldn't trade those times for anything. And I'm really thankful that I was uh, given the privilege to serve in this position. And thank you, Joe, for for letting me do that. And now Diane, when Joe and I talked about the fact that um, the kind of person that we needed to fill the position, you were custom made and God had right person, right time, right place. And that gives me a lot of confidence going forward in my new life to know that everything just fits together when God does it right. So, amen. So I'm, I'm going to pray um, that there are those times you need a lot of prayer, um, but you're up to it and you're doing an awesome job. So, Father, we're so thankful, Lord, that you have all of this figured out when we're scrambling around um, like we don't know what's going on. Father, you have everything figured out. And I just thank you so much for Diane and for her willingness and for her positivity. Lord, this month that we've worked together has been such a blessing to me to be able to work with Diane. And I pray now, Lord, that you will just give her understanding. Lord, give her discernment. Father, give her a clear path in her mind to, to move things in the right direction and to that next step as the praise family of churches grow. Lord, that um, she'll have those that clear path of what needs to be done. And Lord, I just pray that all of the processes work together. Lord, um, all of the online accounts, uh, all of the things that need to be done, Lord, that those will just work together and that Diane will have the blessing. Lord, I, I know I'm your favorite, but I know everybody's your favorite. And Diane is too. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll just send her blessings and little glimpses of your glory just the way you've done me. I just give you all the honor and praise, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Oh man, that's so awesome. And it's, it's really hard to, to just talk right now uh, because the, the, the guiding value of being sent is, is a hard thing um, because not only are you embarking into a new journey, but we're also going to have you at a greater distance than six feet. Uh, but uh, it's been such, a, such an honor and such a privilege to serve alongside of you. And uh, I'm excited to talk about the guiding value of being sent because uh, both of these ladies are being sent. Uh, we're, we're, the reality is that we are all sent and we're sent every day, uh, whether it's across, across the country or into a new position. Um, God has something for us in, in our sending. And it, as we go out and being sent into the world, it teaches us so much about the heart of the Father because um, that's, that's where being sent comes from. We are sent so that we can understand the Father a little bit better. And so uh, blessings to you both. And I know that uh, Diane, you also want to pray over Judy. Well, it's been a privilege to come alongside Judy this month, and I just can't thank you enough for the foundation that you have laid, not only for me to do this job, but for our family of churches. It's been a God thing at a critical time, and you've done an excellent job. So I'm just going to pray for you. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your blessings. And Lord, we thank you for Judy. She has been and is a blessing. And Lord, you have your hand upon her, just like you always have from the beginning of time. And Lord, we thank you for bringing Michael into her life. And Lord, we thank you for the good work you're going to do through them in the future as they go forward. Lord, will you keep your hand of favor upon them? Will you bless them and provide for them? Father, we ask that you use them mightily for your kingdom to speak into the lives of their loved ones and those around them that you might bring across their path. Lord, that they could share the hope that is within them with great joy. And Lord, um, I just pray that their days to come would be covered by you, that you would hem them in on all sides, Lord, that you would be their protection, that you would be their provider, Lord God. And Father, that their days to come would be some of the most joyous that they've ever known. Bless them, keep them, bless Judy, keep her, and Lord, we send them in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Hey, boys and girls, I'm Jessica, and I'm so glad that you could be here with us today. Hello there, boys and girls. You're smiling. You're smiling. 
Your smiling face is always bright my name. Today, we're continuing our series called Rebuilding the Church. Um, Ezra, what's wrong? Oh, it makes me sad when people turn away from God, and that is what we're going to be learning about today. Could you hand me a tissue there, Jessica? Yeah, of course. Thanks. My arms don't work like they used to, so... Um, Oh, that feels much better. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, okay. Uh, We left off when the Temple of God was rebuilt in Jerusalem, and priests traveled to Jerusalem to take care of some of the temple duties. Everything seemed like it was going as good as I could hope for, but then I was given some terrible news. Some of the priests and the leaders and the officials were marrying people that uh, worshipped pagan gods. You see there, boys and girls, pagan gods are made up. They're not real. Make believe. What's a good example I could give them? Oh, like... A Superman. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That one works, too. Um, So the people of Jerusalem were putting these fake gods above the one true God, which was one of the reasons that God allowed the temple to be destroyed in the first place. I was so sad that I tore my clothing and I started pulling hair out of my head. And you pulled the hair out of your beard. Huh? I'm weird. Well, I know people don't pull out their own hair very often, but I was so saddened (laughs) by the news. I even pulled hair out of my chinny chin chin. Mm, But then Ezra got on his knees and he began to pray to God. I said, God, we don't deserve your mercy. Help us turn away from our sin and back to you. And as he was praying, a a large crowd of Israelites began to cry with Ezra and they decided to repent of their sin. That means that they decided to turn away from their sinful ways and follow God. Sometimes turning back to God and away from sin is a really hard thing to do there, boys and girls. But following God is always the right thing to do. Boys and girls, do you think you could draw us a picture of Ezra on his knees praying to Mm. God? What a great idea! And be sure to put on your good listening ears and enjoy the message. Well, thank you, Ezra and Jessica. And kids, uh, we encourage you to keep leaning in, and, and adults as well, as we continue into the book of Ezra today and kind of wrapping up the, the story that's there. And as we enter into the month of August, uh, I just want to uh, kind of recap a little bit of what Pastor Joe shared last Sunday uh, about humility, trusting God, and, and resting in what God has for us. Um, August, as, as Joe mentioned, is a, a month of increase. As, as I was driving here uh, to, to recording uh, today, we just saw all the fields of, uh, of, of the harvest that are happening, the, the grass seed that's down in rows, ready to be picked up and thrashed, the, the balers that were going through the fields baling the hay. Um, this is a month of, of harvest, of increase. And what we're going to be talking about today is waiting on God when we don't know what's next. We can anticipate the increase. We can, we can be ready for that increase. But we don't want to get ahead of what God has for us today. And so as we get into this story, I want to encourage you to um, kind of uh, metaphorically buckle up with me. This is, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a bumpy ride. And we're going to get into some, uh, some deep things, some, some hard topics today. Uh, and I want you to buckle up because I want, at the end of today, I want us to be in the same vehicle together. I don't want us to bump out of this. I want us to stay engaged. And so would you just engage with me for the next uh, few minutes as we talk about Ezra, as we get into especially chapter 9 and, and what he was dealing with and what we are dealing with today because it's very similar. So Ezra chapter 9 and 10, just to give a quick overview. Ezra was, was on his way back to, to Jerusalem with the, the children of Israel who were coming back from exile. Uh, they were set free in a sense. And they were going back to the land that was promised to them by God. But when he was coming back into that land ready to rebuild the walls and to, and to get back into this new temple and to, to settle in, he noticed that the people had gone against what God wanted. 
they had started to intermarry uh, with, with uh, wives from foreign uh, lands. They had started to worship other gods because of that influence. They had strayed away from what God had for them and had asked them to do. And so as we go through this scripture uh, today, we're going to be talking about recognizing compromise, where we have fallen short and where we were unfaithful. We're going to talk about lamenting and confessing before God. And Ezra gives us a great example of that in this scripture. And then we're going to end with uh, the idea of wrestling with God and especially waiting on God. For what is next. The issues of Ezra's day, as I mentioned, were, were intermarriage, were worshiping, worshiping other gods. I'm going to highlight just a couple of, of quick issues that, that I believe we're dealing with today. Um, one of these that has become really apparent in this COVID season is the disparity between those who have and those who don't have, the haves and the have-nots. Uh, those who are doing, were doing well before this season seem to be doing better. You know, they've, they've been able to maintain their jobs and to, to um, maintain kind of what they've, what they've been doing. Their finances are stable. And those who didn't have before are in a harder place today because they've lost their, their income. Uh, housing may be unstable and unsettling for them. Uh, and they're, they're in, a, in a harder place. And as we prepare for a new school year, this is, this is what really, really hits home for me. Uh, is, you know, the announcement this week about what school might look like this coming year being totally online, at least for a while. And having three school-age kids, that's, that's an important thing for me and, and my wife to, to wrestle with. What are we going to do? What are we going to do next? Another issue that, that really is, it, it's in the headlines, and uh, it's, it's a personal issue for me, is, is systemic racism. And uh, there's a lot that, c that could be said on this topic, and, and I'm not going to pretend to have all the answers, and I'm not going to pretend today to, to even have a lot of experiences or really, really many at all to share with you about what it feels like to experience racism because I, I am privileged in many ways. Um, but where this issue is so, imp why this is so important to me personally is because I have a son who does not look like me. And he doesn't experience the same things that I do. Uh, he won't. He's, he's six years old now, but as he grows up in our community, I want him to live uh, with the same opportunities that I had. I want him to experience life uh, in a way that he feels accepted and wanted by his friends at school, by our community, by our family. And so that's why this issue is, is so important. And I know there is so much more we could say about racial injustice and the history of that in our nation. And I know we are talking about it, and I'm, I'm encouraged. I want to just show you this, this article. This is the first physical newspaper I've bought in a long time. Um, but uh, this is a, a screenshot of, of me and, and four other pastors and, and some of our friends who got together and had an uncomfortable conversation about race. Um, uh, I'm a part of a podcast called Pastors in Quarantine, and we wanted to lean into the, the, the cultural issues, the things that are, are dividing us, the things that we're struggling with, and what can we do when we focus back on who God is. So Ezra, in chapter 9, was at this place where he was, was wrestling, and he was confused, and he was broken he was dealing with the guilt and the shame that had been brought uh, to the surface. And the leaders at the time actually were the ones who led the way in this infraction against God. They were unfaithful to God. Where have I been unfaithful? Where have I not lived up to what God expected from me? And I wanted to just share with you briefly about a season of life in college and, and uh, an issue that I've struggled with um, personally over the years is, is pornography. This is where, very clearly, I have been unfaithful to God. And, and uh, I was a part of an accountability group in, in college. Um, some, some friends who I'm still really cl uh, close to and, and can call up and we just kind of pick 
pick up our relationship where we left off. But we would get together at least once a week, and we would sit down, and we would ask hard questions of each other. And it kind of reminds me of Ezra as he's going to the leaders of the people in this chapter, and he's asking the hard questions, and he's pushing the issue because it was, it was important. And as I got into uh, dating Holly, uh, my wife now, and, and as uh, we um, started into that relationship, um, there were times where I had to d- come to her and say, hey, I've dropped the ball here. Um, please still accept me and, and help me to, to move on. Help me to go on to what is next. So as, as we get into this section, it's, um, I just want to leave you with something that I've been thinking a lot about recently, and it's, it's the idea of prejudice. We've talked about racism already just briefly. We've talked about pornography briefly. But I think with both of those issues, prejudice enters in because prejudice is essentially seeing other people differently from how God sees them. Now, if I'm objectifying women in the, in the way, looking at them on a screen in a way that is not honoring to God, it's not the way that God wanted them to be portrayed If I'm looking at someone who has a different skin tone than me and I'm judging them differently or I'm not giving them the same opportunities that I have, I'm seeing them differently from how God sees them. Prejudice is as simple as that. And if we think about it with that definition, how many times, multiple times, every day, do I show prejudice to someone around me? It doesn't have to be a racial thing, but many times it is. Where am I prejudiced? And I think we kind of see this highlighted, and we're going to get back to that in in a moment, with the intermarriage and and the foreign wives and how that interacts in the story. But the first thing that we see in this is lamenting and confessing. So we first, we recognize where the compromise is, where we have been unfaithful to God. And then Ezra gives us a great example of what it looks like to lament and to confess before God. It says in in verse 4 of chapter 9, that everyone who trembled at the words of God, the God of Israel, assembled to me. And this is right after, in verse 3, I'm going to read this from the message. Ezra says, When I heard all of this, when I heard what was going on with the unfaithfulness to God, I ripped my clothes and my cape. I pulled the hair from my head and out of my beard. I slumped to the ground appalled. This is a graphic expression of grief, of lament. And lament essentially just means a recognition of what has been lost. Ezra was recognizing that they had misstepped and they had gone away from God's best for them. That he recognized what had been lost and he made this graphic expression by pulling out his hair and ripping his clothes before the people. And then he entered into this very uh, intense prayer. I would encourage you to read that. We're not going to read that today. But as we think through lament and, and confession and what that might look like for us, um, this is a little bit more lighthearted. And I would encourage you, if you have, if you have a phone with you and, and something to connect with, uh, there's, a, there's a website that the country of Iceland put out, and I'm sure this is a kind of a tourist trap kind of thing. They're, they want to expose people to their country and, and get people excited about it. But it also speaks to this idea of lament. It's called, it's the, the URL is simply looks like you need Iceland. Dot com. Looks like you need Iceland.com.
I think we probably all need Iceland right now because we're stuck at our, in our homes, right? And we, we're in this season where we don't know what to do, to do and how to express our feelings before God. And this website is interesting because you log in there and you can record yourself screaming. Okay, if you're home alone right now, do it. If you're with other people in a community group or something, maybe not. But you can record yourself screaming. It goes into one of seven speakers that they have set up in the wilderness in Iceland. And they broadcast it out in to the, the vast expanse of wilderness for you. So you can be at home and have your screams go out for everyone, well, all the animals, and nothingness in the wilderness to hear. Um, and I think it's a great example of just what it looks like to lament sometimes. Sometimes we don't have the words like Ezra had to say this prayer and to engage with God in that, in, that sort of intensity. Sometimes it just feels like we should scream. Sometimes that's all that we can get out, and sometimes that's enough. Don't encourage you. Look it up. Uh, maybe that's a form of expressing lament for you and just the angst, the anxiety, all of the, all of the things that are on your mind and your heart right now that you just don't know how to express any other way. Looks like you need Iceland.com. My shameless plug. So all of this lamenting and confessing leads us into the third point, which is wrestling with what is next and waiting waiting on God. Ezra ends up demanding that the men divorce their wives and send away their children. Now we know that God had forbidden marrying foreign women. Okay, that's that's true enough. Malachi chapter 2 verses 10 to 16. Say say just that that God wanted his people to be to be pure and whole and focused on him with all of their being, including their marriages, that that would, that would be a place, their family unit would be a unit of, of people who would reflect the glory of God and understand who God was and that even that relationship would push them closer to God. But the people had messed up and they had gotten polluted in a sense by allowing other customs and religions and worship into their households. So we know, according to Malachi 2, that marrying foreign women was forbidden. But what Ezra and the leaders of the time seem to have missed is that very clearly God opposed divorce. God wants the family to stay together. Um, and that's, that's their first solution. And I know, I know divorce is a sensitive issue, and I know some of us have experienced that in our lives. And this is not to, uh, to place shame or blame in, in any one of these cases. But it's to highlight the, the importance of that, that marriage unit. And, and the, the place where I wonder, did Ezra and the other leaders at the time jump into a solution that wasn't really what God wanted for them? I wonder, was this a human solution or, or simply a reaction to the problem? Could they have waited just a little bit longer to hear God's clear voice of what to do? Another wonder that I have is about who we have come to, to know as the Samaritans. If you look up the history of this, uh, many scholars believe that the Samaritans were actually the ones who had inhabited that land that the Israelites were going back into. These were perhaps the wives that the Jewish men had, had married. And the children that they had, had brought into the world were part of this, this culture, this group of people that, that hundreds of years later, in the time of Jesus, we know the Samaritans. There's a couple of instances where Jesus interacts with Samaritans and he highlights them. Uh, the Good Samaritan story. Jesus tells us about uh, someone from this, this group who exhibits truly what it means to be a good neighbor and to love someone and to help them in their time of need. 
This was in contrast to the Jewish leaders of the time. He also meets with a woman at the well who is identified as a Samaritan woman. And he receives water from her, and he offers her the living water, who he is. And he helps her to understand that he is the Messiah, and that he's come for her too. And she goes back and shares that with her whole village, and many people come to believe in Jesus that day. God was clearly for the Samaritans. What was the opportunity that was missed in Ezra's day because they jumped to this conclusion too quickly and didn't consider all that God really wanted for them? So this man named Shechaniah actually brings the solution there. Um, But what is conspicuously silent, I should say who is conspicuously silent in these chapters, is God. Now, backing up in the story just for a moment, Ezra asks a really important question. And I want us to consider this today because this leads us into kind of where do we go from here. Ezra asks in verse 10 of chapter 9, he says, O our God, what shall we say after this? O our God, what shall we say after this? That's an appropriate question. What do we do? And maybe you're asking yourself that today. What do I do now? What do I say now? How do I respond to the situation that I'm in when life has been turned upside down? We're dealing with things that are coming to the surface that have been there for so many generations, and now I need to do something about it, but what is it that I should do? It's a great question. But where Ezra seems to have misstepped here is that he didn't take time to wait and to get that clear answer from God. And that's what I want for us today, is to wait and to get get that clear answer of what God wants for us next. Now Ezra's goal with all of this lament and confession, uh, recognizing where the compromise was, where they were unfaithful, wrestling with God. He ends his prayer in verse 15, and his goal is to stand guilt-free in God's presence. That's a great goal. That's something that I want for myself. I want that for my family. I want that for you today, that you, that you can say, I can stand here guilt-free in front of my God. But at the end of the day, that's only possible because of Jesus. Jesus was what was missing from these chapters. We can only stand guilt-free before God because of him. And as Jesus uh, kind of wrapped up his earthly life, um, this was, I want to share with you just a, a brief story from after he had rose from the dead. The disciples had had already encountered him, and and Thomas had an interaction with Jesus where he showed him his wounds, and he felt them, and he knew that Jesus was alive. And then Jesus disappears for a moment, and Peter says, okay, I'm going to go fishing now. This is in Luke chapter 1, or 21, sorry, not 1. That's when Jesus was born, Luke chapter 21. So Jesus disappears for a moment, and and Peter goes fishing. And what's interesting and kind of ironic is Peter, as this professional fisherman, remember, if you remember back in Peter's life, Jesus found him fishing. And he encourages him that he's going to make him into a fisher of men. And so Peter drops his nets, and he follows Jesus for three years with these other disciples, and they're learning from him, and they're engaged with him, and they're trying to understand who this Messiah is, and what does this look like? And we know that Peter messed up. He denies Jesus, and he says some really dumb things. He cuts a guy's ear off. I mean, come on, Peter. Why? I mean, I wouldn't do that, right? Well, maybe I would. I don't know. I wasn't there. But Peter messed up all along the way, but he was still engaged with Jesus. And then Jesus shows up, and he, he proves that he was raised from the dead. 
And the moment Jesus leaves, just for a moment, Peter goes right back to where he was before. Now, I know this is hitting a little bit close to home today, but I want to pose the question because it's, it's so important that we wrestle with this and we struggle with this. Are we going back to what things were like before? Am I just going, to, as we come out of this season, am I going to just go back to what was comfortable and what I knew? Or am I going to lean in and discover what's next with Jesus? Now, the cool part about this story with Peter is that the story doesn't end with him just not catching anything. But Jesus shows back up. And then his nets are so full they can't even drag them in. They're so heavy. And I think that's the, the exciting thing about this season. And as we think about August as a month of increase and harvest, is the, is the truth that God has the harvest. It's being prepared. Scripture says the fields are white under harvest. The, the crops are ripe. And the harvest will come and Jesus will, will bring that increase. Scripture also says that he will build his church. Okay, this isn't up to you and me. This is up to Jesus. So as we close today, I want us to, to end with that realization. Okay, as we, as we think about recognizing compromise and what that looks like for us, personally, in our church family, in our community, what have we compromised? Where have we been unfaithful to God? What do we need to just kind of sit in and lament and confess and get right before God and recognize that we desperately need him? And then being okay, waiting on what God has for us next. Because he has something good for you. He has something good for us. The harvest is coming. Well, let's be ready. Would you just join with me in prayer? Jesus, we thank you for who you are, that you do bring the harvest, that you bring the fish into the nets. Would you help us to stay close to you and not just go back to what we've known, what is comfortable, but help us to keep walking forward recognizing what has been done in the past, but moving forward with you into a future that is brighter, a future that you have designed and that you are going before us in. Would you help us to be in step with you that we wouldn't get too far ahead or too far behind, but that we would be just right with you as you lead us into this next season. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
search the world but it couldn't fill me a man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never
Jesus is the only one who can. As Ezra wrapped up his prayer in Ezra 9, he says, Here we are before you, God, in our guilt, because no one can stand before you. We can only stand guilt-free in front of God because of Jesus. He is the only one who can. We're going to enter into a, a moment of communion. And if you're, if you're on your own, I would encourage you to grab uh, something to eat and something to drink. It could be bread and it could be grape juice. It could be something else. Uh, something just to represent Jesus' body and his blood that was given for us. If you're in your community group, I'd encourage you to take a moment to do this as well and to um, just reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made because it is because of his sacrifice that we can stand guilt-free before God. This is the solution that Ezra didn't have, and we have it today. You have it today. You have the solution of Jesus and his death, his sacrifice for your sins to take away all of that and to let you live, allow you to live into what is next. And so I um, just want to encourage you to uh, gather up your supplies. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus to live like us, to identify with us and so that we can identify and understand you. Oh, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, for his, his broken body, which is represented in what we're eating today, in his blood that was spilt on the cross, which is represented by what we're drinking today. We thank you that because of that sacrifice, we can now stand before you guilt-free. We pray, God, that you would address anything that is on our hearts today where we are feeling that guilt and shame. God, would you bring that up? Would you help us to set that before you again, recognizing what you've done for us? And we pray this all in, in your name, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you just take uh, the elements with me today? Now, as we wrap up this time, I want to encourage you to gather around in your community groups. If you're there, if you're at home, get, grab a journal like we've, we've been talking about week to week. Um, find a way to express uh, and, and to apply some of these things that we're talking about today. What I want you to, to discuss, uh, first of all, is how do you deal with frustration? How do you deal with the anxiety, with the, uh, the lament the recognition of what was lost. How do you express that? Uh, maybe you want to pull out your phone and, and pull up the, the, uh, the Iceland website and <laughs> scream into it together in your group. Um, shared experiences are always ways to, uh, to build relationship and things that we can look back on together. So whatever that looks like for you, have a moment to, to wrestle with that. What does it look like to express your frustration and lament before God. Secondly, take a moment to share uh, what you're in the middle of. What are you waiting on God for, for what's next? Uh, we want this to be uh, a discussion that reflects our guiding value of being safe with each other. So um, we want this to be a safe place for you to, to share. And if you're not comfortable sharing responses to either of these questions, uh, feel free to say pass and, and to um, just enter into what you, you are comfortable with and express that in your groups as much as you can to pray with each other, to discuss, to, to wrestle with this. Because God has something good for each of us next. Let's be okay in the waiting. Have a great week.